Greetings and salutations from beautiful West Palm Beach, Florida. Burr, 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 burr. Welcome back to my channel. Growing up in the 90s, an era some would consider the best in pop culture, I got to see many of the trends that have inspired our modern world. From the internet invading our homes, both MJs in their primes, the mobile phone, and many, many more. I've always loved fashion and menswear, and thinking back on it, urban wear really had a big influence on that. Urban wear's roots, rise, and subsequent fall are a fascinating history that I really want to kind of dive into. So let's talk about it. We can trace urban wear's roots back to New York's 70s and 80s gang and street culture. During that time, street gangs wore highly customized denim jackets, leather, jeans, sneakers, and boots. Since these groups were often influenced by biker gangs, their style kind of mimicked theirs with their gang affiliation plastered all over the back of their denim jackets. It was also a way for them to express themselves through their clothing. As the street gangs began to evolve through the 80s and start ramping down on the street wars between each other, they found new ways to battle. Here we can see hip hop in its infancy. Crews went from street fights to dance battles, trading their tough leather jackets and denim jeans for Adidas tracksuits in bright colors, and of course, they had to have the shell toes to match. Sportswear became the uniform of hip hop as the 80s winded down and the major players were Paulo and eventually the scrappy upstart Tommy Hilfiger. Both were at the forefront of street fashion, supplementing their classic tailoring and Hamptons yacht style for bold, colorful, maximal, graphic-laden design. Their fresh new approach resonated with hip-hop and the streets as much as it did their core, yuppie audience. Ralph Lauren shunned the love from the hood while still reveling in the free advertising and increased profits, but Tommy and his team embraced it. They directly partnered with some of the biggest names in hip-hop at the time and were known to just pull up to the hood with some up-and-coming MCs at the time with care packages. This marked the beginnings of urban wear as we know it. A young Carl Jones who had already founded Surf Fetish, a surf culture inspired brand, entered the chat. You see, there was a style shift in urban communities and by proxy in hip hop. Straight leg and boot cut denim dominated in the 70s and 80s, but now the street favored more baggy silhouettes. Carl noticed in order to achieve this look, people were just buying their pants and shirts a few sizes too big. As a result, they were too big in the areas that you really need your clothes to fit, like your waist and your shoulder. Carl decided that he had the cure, building his product from the ground up with the urban consumer in mind. His pants were baggy, but they still fit in the waist. It was the same with his shirts, finally giving the urban customer exactly what they were looking for. He named his label Cross Colors, and with the help of graphic designer Thomas Walker, together they set out to create a brand focused on positive and anti-racism message. Cross Colors was able to grow by partnering with some of the biggest artists in hip-hop at the time. Through their ad campaigns, but also by taking a page out of Tommy Hilfiger's playbook and gifting artists for their increasing number of television appearances as well as their shows, they were able to get the kind of visibility that they need to really become one of the staples in urban wear. While Polo and Tommy inadvertently created the market, Cross Colors defined and refined it, creating opportunities for other ambitious young designers to enter the market. Speaking of creating opportunities, here's an opportunity for you to take the time and leave a little like on this video as it really helps your boy out and helps me grow this channel. And of course, if you're rocking with this and any of my other content, feel free to click that little subscribe button and let them know. Let them know that you fox with your boy. You feel what I'm saying? Do me that little favor. And if you're feeling extra spicy, go ahead and click them, them notification buttons. Click all the notifications so you know when I drop a new video and I'm going to keep serving you up this fire content. So so now, back to the video. With the market established, we started seeing those early players of the 90s like Carl Kanai, who probably needs his own separate video detailing the rise of his label, Maurice Malone, Pelly Pelly, which predates cross colors by nearly a decade, Mecca, and more. Simultaneously, more established brands like Nautica, DKNY, and Guess were subtly embracing Urban Wear's influence, creating sub-labels designed to directly compete with this emerging market. As hip-hop grew in mainstream popularity, so 
did Urban Wear. With these labels that were often regulated to just local mom and pop shops, now being featured in big department stores like Macy. With millions of dollars being generated from Urban Wear's growing popularity, this set the stage for hip hop to take a more direct approach. By the time we reached the mid 90s, we saw the rise of the rapper owned clothing line. Taking notice of how much their own influence and star power generated for these brands, while also having an affinity for fashion and style themselves, rappers started founding their own labels. There was Russell Simmons with Fat Farm and later Baby Fat, which was founded by his then wife, Kimora Lee Simmons. Fat Farm set the tone, creating a range inspired by Russell's own hood prep style, remixing classics like the sweater vest, polo shirt, and chinos, pairing them with graphic heavy tees and baggy silhouettes. The infamous Wu-Tang Clan brought us Wu Wear, drawing inspiration from sportswear. The focus was on bold graphics centered around lyrics from their albums and their recognizable W logo. There was Rockerwear, built out of Jay-Z's and eventually Rockefeller's records success in the late 90s and early 2000s. Initially starting out as graphic tees with some of Jay-Z's memorable lyrics like money, cash, what? The brand eventually branched off to include an entire range of men's, women's, and even kids. They also spun out additional brands like Team Rock and State Property. Chang Gang? One of the most notable hip hop owned brands was Diddy's Sean John. Diddy's vision for urban wear was a bit more refined and luxurious as he was taking influence from the designers at the time that he was wearing. Diddy's goal was to be an all encompassing luxury take on urban wear. Dabbling in not only the standard graphic tees and baggy pants, but also suits, shoes, fragrances, and more. This also marked a sharp change in the urban wear market. Urban wear hit its peak at the turn of the century as the market became oversaturated with too many brands doing pretty much the same things. It was no longer the unique expression of urban style. Now it was mainstream and with so many options littering department stores around the country, it was only natural that consumers would turn their attention elsewhere. Many of these urban labels were sold off to massive conglomerates who, in their effort to maximize sales and increase profits, oversaturated the market with generic looking silhouettes. Brands like LRG began the transition from urban wear to street wear, the concurrent style movement born out of 80s and 90s skate culture. Rappers themselves turned to luxury labels now that the hip hop economy was booming. Of course, these luxury labels saw an opportunity to capitalize on that. By the mid 2000s, urban wear was just an afterthought. A few larger brands like Sean John and Rockwear remained, but they were just a shell of their former selves. Ultimately, it was the oversaturation and changing of trends that killed urban wear. Instead of studying the trends that their market gravitated towards, these brands pumped out more of the same to come back declining sales, which is never a good thing to do. Once we got to the point where these brands were nearly indistinguishable, it, it was like the urban market pretty much evaporated and everybody lost interest. Though there has been a recent research resurgence in popularity, mostly due to the vintage craze of late. Attempts to revive those brands of the 90s have mostly fallen flat. Still, the legacy and influence on modern fashion trends is undeniable. And you know, these urban wear brands really do need their flowers for pioneering an entire industry and creating a product for a underserved market. It really is sad to see such influential brands suffer such a terrible fate, but it happens. It just It's just the up and down of the market. It's it's the things that you like today may not be the things that you like tomorrow. And that's perfectly cool. Still, I, I really wanted to talk about these things because as we move further and further away from their peak, which was, you know, mid late 90s, maybe early 2000s, these things kind of get forgotten and get recycled as something quote unquote new. So I just wanted to put this out into the world so that it exists. So maybe somebody like me who was looking around for more information about this will find this video and have something to look at. Obviously, there is a ton, ton, ton of detail information that I left out. I, I couldn't just talk about literally everything. Otherwise, this video would have been extremely long and I just wanted to do the basics. But if y'all are vibing with this, I definitely recommend that you watch this video that I did on the most radical Jordan brand commercial, which kind of falls in line with this kind of conversation about urban wear. And you can check that out up next.